The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, the cryptocurrency crash. What does it mean for the NFT market? Plus, Norway's vast new national museum and Spanish-American art in Los Angeles. I talked to the writer and critic Amy Castor about what effect the tumbling crypto markets might have on the until now booming world of non-fungible tokens or NFTs. As Norway's National Museum opens this weekend, I speak to its director, Karen Hinsbo. And this episode's work of the week is a folding screen with Indian wedding, mitote and flying pole made in Mexico in the late 17th century. One of the major pieces in a new show at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art called Archive of the World, Art and Imagination in Spanish America 1500 to 1800. Ilona Katsu, the curator of the exhibition, talks in depth about the meanings and purpose of the work. Before all that, why not try a digital subscription to the art newspaper? The price for the first three months is £1, $1 or €1, euro, depending on where you live, and then it's £10, $10 or €10 euros per quarter after that. You get full access to the website and the app for iOS and Android, plus the e-paper archive of the newspaper and fair dailies. Go to theartnewspaper.com, click subscribe, and the promo code is TRIAL, all in capital letters. Do also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening now, and to our sister podcast, A Brush With the latest series of which continues with a conversation with a British artist, Emma Talbot. Do also give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, a wobble, a meltdown, a crash. These are a few of the terms used to describe what's going on in the world of cryptocurrencies, with Bitcoin now worth around half of what it was at its peak in November last year. But what does it mean for the blockchain-based non-fungible tokens, or NFTs, that have swept the art market and prompted some eye-popping prices over the last couple of years? I asked Amy Castor, a writer focused on cryptocurrencies and NFTs, what she thinks. Amy, I wanted to begin by talking about the perceived crypto crash. Is there a crypto crash? Oh, yes, there is. There is definitely there is definitely a drop in the crypto prices overall. Bitcoin has lost 60% of its value since it's a November high of $69,000. So it's it's barely sort of keeping its head above 30,000 at this point. Okay. And um, one of the things that occurs to me reading around this subject is that data in relation to crypto, in relation to the blockchain, in relation to NFTs, which we're going to come to talk about, is really difficult to analyze. A lot of the data is very partial and comes directly from people who are invested in presenting crypto as a success. So how can we find our way through it? Well, it depends, Ben, because we can see everything that's on the blockchain. That's a public ledger that's viewable to everybody. So we can see transactions that are happening there. But there's some things we don't know about. We don't know the whole story about what's happening within the exchanges themselves. So sometimes some parts of the uh, the NFT market are hard to discern because that can be a little bit opaque at times. And if, as you say, crypto is in a really troubled moment right now, what does that mean for NFTs? Well, um, NFTs are generally bought and sold with Ethereum. And when Bitcoin drops in value, all the other coins drop as well. It's just we tend to mostly quote the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum because those are the two top cryptos. But when crypto drops in price, we're going to see, obviously, that that should impact the NFT markets as well because that's what NFTs are bought and sold with. Overall in the markets, I mean, we know in the stock markets too, people are moving away from risky assets and NFTs are (laughs) the riskiest. So tell us about the risk of an NFT. Why is it particularly risky? Well, NFTs are a very illiquid market. You know, I mean, when you sell, for example, a high value NFT, you have to find one special buyer. It's not like uh, with Bitcoin or Ether or cryptocurrencies where one Bitcoin is worth every Bitcoin. Those markets tend to be more liquid, you know. But NFTs, you know, if there's an NFT selling for $200,000 in Ether, you've got to find a special person who wants to buy that, you know, and a a special reason for them to buy that. So, you know, it's harder to find buyers for NFTs, obviously. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And of course, you know, this is an art podcast. The art newspaper is the art newspaper. So, of course, we're experiencing in the art world one particular facet of a much broader world of NFTs, right? Yes. You know, there's NFTs that are used for gaming, music. I mean, NFTs represent a lot of different things. So I would expect you're looking mostly at art-based NFTs. But one of the things that's occurred to me is that I'm getting, let's say, 100 emails a week from people presenting NFT projects as art projects. And they might involve one or other celebrity or tech billionaire or sports person. So what's interesting to me is that it seems concerned with the financial markets and so often very little, in fact, to do with the art. So tell me about that. Where are the crossovers and can we easily distinguish between those categories, if you like? Well, I think NFTs are speculative investment and they're similar to cryptocurrency in that you're just betting on whether they go up in value. I would tend to say that's the only reason for buying an NFT is that you hope it'll go up in value later on. But as we've seen with Board Ape Yacht Club, a lot of people own Board Ape NFTs because it's like a badge of honor. It means that if you're an investor, you're successful, you got in early, and a lot of people will, will use that to promote their own NFT projects that they're pitching. So at any given time, there's all these sort of copycat projects. Um, there's all these NFT collections that sort of try to capture the popularity or the success of, of things like uh, punks or other collectible NFTs in the past, Board Ape Yacht Club where they also kind of want to be the next thing. The idea is that you want to get in early at the ground floor when you can buy them for next to nothing. And then hopefully one day they'll be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars in Ethereum. Right. And, and to what extent is this all a confection or an invention of a group of people who stand to benefit from it? Because that's one of the things that always intrigues me. You know, what is the real value of an NFT? To what extent is it kind of purely inflation for the sake of inflation the real value is it's always going to be speculative the real value is if it goes up over time and in the crypto markets in general the crypto verse we call it a crypto boosters crypto fans nft fans the idea is to to try to get the public retail investors to put their real dollars into those markets because the, the cryptoverse is always looking for what we call new suckers or a way to bring in more cash. So we see a, a succession of what we like to call grifts or sort of ideas where, you know, in 2017, it was always about the initial coin offering, right? And that was the big excitement and all the, the news headlines were about the next ICO project where somebody would sort of write up a white paper the night before and have some loose idea for a project, but, you know, buy this token and you can get in early on the project, but it was always about, well, maybe this token will go up in value. And so, you know, there've been, just different ways of spinning different stories and different sort of levels of excitement in the whole space to get new cash flows to come in. And NFTs sort of were the big thing in 2021, you know, and then it sort of morphs into something else with decentralized autonomous organization, these fractionalized NFTs, <laughs> you know, games. So it's always sort of reinventing itself with a new idea. And with NFTs, we're just this sparkling, you know, great way to bring the public into the space because everybody could relate to artists struggling to make money and, you know, technology can save them. So it, it had sort of like this mass appeal. So in that sense, you know, NFTs were really successful at, at getting the public's attention. And you are obviously inside this world in the sense that you're a writer, you're an independent writer on this subject. But at the same time, it's really crucial to me that so many of the commentators on NFTs are sort of invested in it in the sense that they own Bitcoin, they own property within this field. You're not. And so it appears often from the outside of this world to be kind of like the Wild West. But do you think it's like that? Or do you feel there is some core value to it, if you like, core human value to this whole experience. I haven't found any real value in NFTs, um, mainly because there is no way to link the actual token on the blockchain to the actual thing that it represents, right? 
There's no way to link the two. The only thing that you have on an NFT is basically a link to something on a centralized server somewhere. So it's supposed to be this decentralized way of trading and, and, you know, recording assets on the blockchain, but really you're just linking to something on a centralized server somewhere. So I don't see the value in that myself, but it's been hyped a lot as, you know, this is sort of a groundbreaking way to track digital art, which is otherwise just infinitely reproducible. I mean, anybody can just take a board ape image or the image of the Beeple NFT that sold for 69 million in ether on Christie's in March, 2021, that kicked off this whole thing. Anybody can take that, download it, copy, share it, whatever. In the digital world, you know, there is no original. That doesn't apply. There's no original because every digital copy of a JPEG or GIF is the same as the one before it. They're all the same. It seems to me that there's a lot of investment from the art world in NFTs. I mean, even yesterday, Pace announced that it's got a deal with Artblocks. So this is an NFTs company. So it seems to me that the art world is going to pursue the NFTs line for some time to come, even despite the fact that we were talking about the markets tumbling. Do you see it has a long term future? Well, I think there's a lot of money that's gone into NFT platforms, that's gone into the whole NFT space. You know, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, we call a- A16Z, it's more commonly known, is a huge venture capitalist firm in Silicon Valley, and they've, they've put uh, enormous amounts of money into this. I mean, in January, they just announced another $4.5 billion crypto fund. So they're not going to just let this fade away. It'll probably go quiet for a while and then there'll be some new talking point, some new, you know, I think probably related to games and NFTs will be the next big thing. But it's it's not just going to go away. After the Wall Street Journal reported that the NFT market was just done with or had collaped or whatever, there were all, all these other stories that came after that that said, yep, the NFT market, it's it's done. You know, the boom is over. You know, it's really hard to read into the data that's coming in about NFTs because all that data comes from the NFT marketplaces themselves. And it's hard to know how much of that is reflective of what's really going on. You know, for example, you know, wash trading is, is prominent in the whole crypto space. Wash trading is, for example, when the same buyer and seller is, is buying and selling the same NFTs back and forth to sort of make it look like there's a lot of activity on the NFT marketplace or to make it look like the asset is more in demand than it actually is or to to create an artificial price history for that. I mean, Looks Rare was a NFT marketplace that launched in January that was sort of a challenger to OpenSea, which is the most popular NFT marketplace. And it turns out that most of the trading on Looks Rare was all fake. I mean, there was like $8 billion of, of fake trading going on, right? And chain analysis came out with a report in February that said that there was significant wash trading in the NFT market. There was a recent indictment against a former executive on OpenSea where he was <laughs> he was buying NFTs before he listed them, where he knew, knew they were being listed on the front page, and then they'd go up in price, and then he'd sell them. So there's a lot of shenanigans going on in that marketplace that's hard to track, that can impact the numbers that we're seeing. Wall Street Journal got the numbers from non-fungible with, that tracks all the data from the space, but it's hard to know what's real and what's not real, what's really going on. I don't think that NFTs are over with quite yet. I think there'll still be a lot of money going in there to to boost it up. Do you think that ultimately the art NFT world and the financial speculative NFT world will separate to a certain degree, that there'll be a pocket of interest in the art element from people who are just sort of interested in exploring the blockchain as a kind of art space fundamentally, and then just what we've been talking about, this speculative financial world, if you like. I don't think so, Ben, because like I said, there's no way to really connect the NFT to the art. It's not really benefiting the art space in any way because the two aren't linked. The token and the actual underlying asset are not linked. So it will always be a speculative investment. What we've been seeing more lately is where these collections of NFTs, like 10,000 apes, 10,000 dogs, 10,000 mutant apes that come out and people try to get early. And then, then as that becomes more popular, then hopefully that'll, they can sell it for more money later on. So that's sort of different than say the art market, but they're still speculative. I think it's harder for 
the companies behind these assets to make money off of just purely art-based NFTs. I think it's easier to make money off the NFT collections of 10,000. They're all 10,000 punks, 10,000 whatever. I was intrigued to read a data analyst within the kind of NFT world describing the punks and kitties and everything like that as the blue chips of the NFT world, whereas the art stuff is just in a different category. And it seemed intriguing to me within, you know, outside of the art space, that actually the NFTs are existing more within this world where, you know, celebrities are puffing them and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, celebrities have played a big role in boosting NFTs. It's sort of like Scientology. (laughs) Scientology got a big boost from getting all these celebrities to come in. So celebrities are, they're acquiring NFTs sort of like in a mysterious way. I mean, they've got millions of social media followers on Twitter and Instagram and all that. So if you can get a celebrity to say, hey, I bought this NFT, this Moon Owl, this Bored Ape, this whatever, um, then that does a lot to boost the entire collection. But it's never been clear how these celebrities like Jimmy Fallon, Paris Hilton, and so on, are, are getting these NFTs, you know, because why would somebody spend 350 million on a, a board ape? It just doesn't make sense. You know, I mean, if you get in really early in the game, then you've paid practically nothing for it and it can go up tenfold. But, but I mean, is it going to go up from 350,000 right now? The floor price on a board ape yacht club NFT is 160,000. I just checked this morning. Well, Amy, it's a crazy world, but thank you for explaining it to us a bit. Well, thank you very much, Ben. Thank you for having me. You can read Amy's thoughts on crypto and NFTs at amycaster.com and the Art Newspaper's reports on this area at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for Android and iOS, which you can download from Google Play and the App Store. Coming up, we hear about the National Museum in Norway and a 17th century Spanish-American folding screen. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. Tate is to deaccession a thousand documents and sketches said to have come from the studio of Francis Bacon. They're to be returned to Barry Jewell, a close friend of the artist who donated them to Tate in 2004. At the time of the donation, the material was apparently valued at around £20 million and was described as probably the Tate Archive's most important acquisition ever. A Tate statement issued on Wednesday records that the Jewell donation has been researched by art historians who have raised credible doubts about the nature and quality of the material. And so it's now considered unsuitable for retention in the Tate archive. Jewell has consistently and robustly defended the authenticity of the material. While the climate emergency is threatening heritage across the world, the ancient Iraqi city of Zakiku, submerged by the Mosul Dam built by Saddam Hussein in 1980, has emerged as the waters of the Tigris recede due to droughts in southern Iraq. The site has reappeared every few years, usually in November, when water levels have dropped after long Iraqi summers. But this year, it remained above water through January and February, as unprecedented levels of water have been drawn from the reservoir to stop crops from drying out due to the droughts. Zakiku's emergence underscores Iraq's ongoing challenges with climate change, but has also provided a unique window of opportunity to further excavate and document the 3,400-year-old Mitanni Empire-era city. And finally, the artist Paul Arago has died in London aged 87 after a short illness. Though born in Portugal, which has provided much of her political and social subject matter, including themes of anti-fascism and bodily autonomy, Rago lived in London from the 1960s and is regarded as one of the most important painters working in Britain in recent decades. As well as hard-hitting contemporary subjects, she drew on a huge range of literary sources, including fairy tales. Drawing underpinned her work throughout, and in her last two decades, she abandoned painting on canvas to make extraordinary coloured pastels on a grand scale. Though she received acclaim across her career, the last few years have seen increased recognition of her achievement. In 2021, she had a retrospective at Tate Britain, and a large space in the current Venice Biennale exhibition, The Milk of Dreams, is dedicated to her. Victoria Miro, who represented Rago for the last few years of her life, said she was a fearless artist who painted life and the world head-on, a remarkable, dazzling and powerful force for good and for change. We have lost a very great artist. You can hear our response to Rago's room in Venice on our podcast special from the Biennale, which was published on the 22nd of April. And you can read more about all these stories on the website and the app. We'll be back after this. 
The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This summer, Christie's invites you to rediscover Britain's capital with London Now, a festival of exhibitions, events and auctions taking place from now until the 15th of July. Under the theme of the art of literature, explore a selection of outstanding art and objects from Christie's summer sale season in the Auction Highlights exhibition and take a deeper dive into the inextricable links between the visual and literary arts in the Loan and Selling exhibition. Both showcases bring together artistic masterpieces through the ages with a novel poetry, drama and stories that have inspired them and which they, in turn, have inspired. Celebrate the infinite variety of this global cultural hub with the London Now Festival calendar of talks and events happening online and in person at 8 King Street, St James's. Entry is free and open to all. Discover more at christies.com or via the hashtag LondonNow2022 across all social media platforms. Welcome back. Now, tomorrow, the 11th of June, the biggest museum in the Nordic countries, Norway's National Museum, opens in Oslo, with more floor space than the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. The museum, which has cost 6.1 billion kroner, around £500 million, has been created from the merger of four of Norway's major art and design museums, including the National Gallery, which houses Edvard Munch's The Scream, museums dedicated to contemporary art, architecture and arts and crafts, and an agency that created national touring exhibitions. It's been a long process. The museums were merged administratively between 2003 and 2005. In 2008, the site of the new museum on Oslo Fjord was chosen. An architectural competition was held in 2009 and won by the German-Italian architect Klaus Schuwerk and building commenced in 2014. It was supposed to open in 2020, but delays pushed it back to this week. I spoke to the institution's director, Karen Hinsbo, as she prepared to open the museum at last. Karin, I heard that before the creation of this vast museum, there was a, quite a debate in Norwegian society and politics. Can you say something about that debate and what were the big issues at stake? Yes, uh, throughout the whole of Norway, there's been a huge consolidating process, merging several minor museums into bigger units. And that's been uh, taking place uh, all over the country. And the National Museum is also a result of that process with the merger of five different institutions into one, the National Museum. And that took place 20 years ago. (laughs) What was the impetus behind it? And obviously you have distinctive institutions Mm. which have their own ways of doing things. Um, And there are advantages and disadvantages to that, I imagine. I think it was the noble attempt to also equip the museums to meet the expectations. There's been uh, growing expectations throughout the past 30 years uh, for what you expect in a museum is quite different now than 30 years ago, at least in uh, at least in Norway. So I think it was an attempt to accommodate that. But of course, uh, there's also been some debate about it. Uh, one fear of loss of uh, the individuality of the specific institution and uh, also maybe uh, lose the specific collections in like a, a more massive pool. So uh, I think it's an overall natural debate. Right. And so in terms of how you've gone about actually installing the museum and showing these different collections brought into one, how have you maintained the kind of individual identities of those different collections? Yeah, when we um, have huge discussions of how should we present this, should we merge everything together or what should we do? Should we organize everything in themes or should we have a narrative and how do we do it? And um, and then we decided upon we go chronologically, but not like with a focus on ism and periods, but more like with a focus on the theme in each room, but you will kind of see it chronologically. Maybe we'll have some bridges here and there and contemporary pieces uh, into yeah, the antiquity and stuff like that. But um, And then we also wanted to present the narrative of the human being in, in the world and Norwegian history and uh, the history of Norway in the world. So uh, So that was the scope. And then when you look at the collections, they are not um, complete. No museum collection is that. And in order for us to have that narrative, uh, we presented mainly arts and crafts on the first floor and visual arts on the second floor. But of course, we have some uh, cross-disciplinary scopes as well throughout the whole uh, collection display and then, uh, and that also means that um, in the first floor, we start with antiquity. And on the second floor in the visual arts, we start with the Renaissance. And that is also because of the collections that we have. And in terms of when you bring that together, do the gaps almost, because you are 
creating this vast institution do the gaps become bigger in a way if you see what I mean because yeah. you, because if you're trying to present a universalist notion of art and art history suddenly I imagine those gaps might become a bit more glaring yeah universal history of art I wouldn't say that uh, that was our ambition that would be <laughs> quite ambitious uh, uh, we are the national museum in, in Norway so of course the, the focus in, is also on Norwegian art Norwegian art history design and architecture but then you might say it's an interesting question uh, because I think maybe the gaps become more and more visible for many reasons in uh, a lot of museums uh, right now. Also, you are very much aware now of what you have missed in a way that you kind of maybe wasn't in the same way 10 or 15 years ago. So we also had a, a focus on including more female artists also with older pieces, uh, which is more difficult to uh, acquire. And Sami arts has been uh, mm. quite important for us to include and present in a much bigger scale. I'm really interested in that aspect, the Sami art, because there's obviously a huge debate in museums at the moment about decolonization, yeah. about representing indigenous cultures yeah. and so on. Has there been a, a long process of integrating Sami art into the museum? Yes, we've been working for years. I think it would last four years. That's been like a really important factor. But it is a difficult process, but we have a very really good dialogue with the Sami environment. And then we have um, this amazing collection um, in the north, uh, Rita Dottua Museet, who needs a museum also. So uh, one Norway nice. should consider building a museum up there. I know they want one. So we have quite good uh, collaboration with the environment uh, and the Rita Dottua Museet. And in terms of the way Sami art is presented, is it integrated or is it separate? Because it's always an interesting debate about how you bring Indigenous cultures into a collection yeah. where it really wasn't previously represented. Yeah, no, it is integrated. Uh -huh. Actually, the first piece you see when you enter the museum is a piece by a Sami artist, uh, Marat Ansawa, called Pilo Sapme Supreme which is uh, this amazing piece that was also presented at the former documenter with these skulls from reindeers hanging like in a big carpet or a flag. And then when you go uh, closer, you would see there's a hole in the skulls. So this is also um, a critique towards the forced slaughter of the reindeer population in uh, the north of Norway. And obviously that's an, a very bold statement to have at the start, the opening of a museum, and it's a government-funded museum. And I, I wonder, there's also a big debate in museums at the moment about governance and in terms of, you know, if this is a state museum, to what extent is the culture mm. ministry involved? To what extent are you allowed complete freedom in terms of your curating? No, we um, operate with complete freedom in the National Museum. It is uh, our curators that decide what is on display in the National Museum at any time. That's good to hear. You mentioned women artists, for instance, and, and I know that in terms of the contemporary displays, you've got this partnership with the Friedrichsen family. Yes. Can you tell us about that partnership and what it brings into the museum? Yeah, this uh, partnership is threefold, actually. So we are working uh, together with the Fredrickson family to build a collection of international art that will kind of support uh, our own collection or throw p new perspectives of our own um, collection. And that should be like internationally really renowned artists uh, on a scale that would not be able for the National Museum to acquire at all. So, for instance, now on display, we have uh, Lee Krashner, an amazing piece by her, Joni Mitchell, an amazing painting by Eva Hesse, got George O'Keefe. <laughs> and, uh, amazing and, you know, Faith Ringgold. A, yeah, a Faith Ringgold, yes, we just, yeah. we just got that in. That is just amazing. Featuring Michael Jackson yes. in, in the bad period. Yeah, 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 yeah it, it's so amazing. So we just got that up and got that in. And pieces like that, it's, it's simply not possible uh, for us to acquire them. So we have a collaboration with them, but we have a wish list. And what is bought is from that wish list. And we decide alone what will be on display and what will be not be on display in the National Museum. So we only take in the pieces that we want to um, display them. And then we have an agreement doing a biannual uh, commission show. And that is exhibitions for the, we have a great uh, hall on top of the building. Uh, we call it the light hall. It's seven meters to the roof. 
2,000 square meters in total, but you can divide that into <laughs> smaller exhibition spaces. And then uh, the, um, the walls of glass. So that is not an easy space to work with. It's an amazing space, but it's not an easy space. This commission series, it would also be internationally renowned artist that takes on the space and just try really to, to work with it. So the first one up is Lo Provost. I can say that I've seen the drawings. It's gonna be it's gonna be so amazing. It'd be completely wild. Uh, so, but they are funding this commission series as well. And the last part in that collaboration is uh, PhDs. So we have uh, an agreement on four PhDs that they will fund. That's great. And in terms of the architecture, you talked about the light hall. The museum's also covered in slate. And I wondered to what extent decisions about materials have been led by environmental concerns, because, of course, building a massive new museum is is potentially enormously ruinous environmentally. So how have you avoided that? Actually, the museum is a future build project. That is uh, the way that we name it in uh, in Norway. I think it's the first uh, future build uh, project by the um, Norwegian state company, the contractors that have uh, actually built the museum. And that means that uh, there's several criteria that needs to be fulfilled. And one is uh, that uh, the imprint should be at least 50% lower than usual uh, buildings. That is one thing. So. So everything is uh, considered here. It's the material that you use in the museum, but also the solutions. So one is the slate that just ages with time. Another one is the oak floor. That is uh, another material that ages with time. So that's been like, um, I would say, a perspective with centuries in mind, not decades. So that's, of course, been important, but also... um, it's recycled steel, so it's like in, in all the solutions. And then we also use seawater to heat and cool the museum, so it's also a sustainable solution in the running. And actually, uh, to be a future build project, you also need to commute, so it needs to be close to uh, public transportation. So we have no parking spaces, it's just for disabled parking, we have that of course. But no parking spaces. I do not have a parking space. Nobody in the museum's got a parking space. We all use our bikes or um, public transportation, which is quite important factor also. And the same goes for the audience, of course. I wondered if it's also important that you have all the storage of the artwork on site, as it were, or most of it, in the sense that obviously one of the things about constantly changing displays is that it requires an enormous amount of transport and therefore a huge demand on the environment. Was that one of the concerns? Obviously, it's very convenient too for the curators and conservators. Yes, of course. And it's more efficient to have the storage. And it's also the conservative studios, photographer studios and all that. We have that on site, which is uh, quite amazing when you think of it, because we have a prime location in Oslo. And uh, (laughs) one could have considered just having the display at this prime location and then going like one hour out of Oslo for the rest. But one was quite foresighted when one took this decision some years ago in, uh, in Norway. So I'm really grateful for that because it means more that, well, that you should think it enables us to work in a completely different manner. And we already did new discovery on, on the collection because of these great uh, facilities and because of we are all together under one roof and we have this direct access to the whole of the collection. That's remarkable. I also wanted to talk about Oslo more generally and, and what the atmosphere is like in the art world there now because the Munk Museum opened last year. You've now yes. got this vast new museum. Mm. Does it feel transformed? You know, one imagines, in, you know, certainly from an architectural perspective, it looks transformed. Yes. But does it have a feeling of that too? Yes, I think so. And uh, as you say, Oslo is a city that has undergone quite significant changes in the past 20 years. I think it's quite important also, and I feel privileged, that in Norway one has prioritized to invest in culture and cultural buildings. So when you uh, have this huge transformation of a capital, then you actually uh, take the prime locations and use them for cultural institution. I think that is quite an important statement. Uh, because it's not only, uh, as you mentioned, the new National Museum that is opening now. We have the Monk Museum, which is a great museum, I personally think. And then we have the public library Deichmann that just opened also last year, which is an amazing library. You should really, really go there. And then also the Opera House uh, in Norway. It's, it's not that long ago that it was built. So you have right by the waterfront at the prime location, you have this um, amazing public art institutions. And then we also have just next to us is the Astro Fernley Museum. 
So it's an amazing cultural capital, Oslo. And then in terms of who the audience is for this new cultural capital, if you like, yeah. obviously international visitors will be welcome, but you have a, a particular local audience and, and you are, as you've said, you know, the National Museum. Yeah. Is it constantly about balancing those two demands, about visitors from overseas plus the local audience? Yes, but it's always been like that. <laughs> Because uh, also in the former museums, uh, we were working with the local audience as well as uh, a travelers and, uh, and tourists. It should be that because we want to display our collection to the Norwegian public, but we also wanted to display it to an international audience. Well, Karin, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. The National Museum in Oslo opens tomorrow and you can read more about it on the website and the app. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. The Los Angeles County Museum of Art, or LACMA, this week opens Archive of the World, Art and Imagination in Spanish America 1500-1800, to a comprehensive survey of LACMA's collection of Spanish American art, formed largely over the past 15 years. It features more than 90 works in a range of media, from which its curator, Ilona Katsu, has chosen to talk about folding screen with Indian wedding, mitote and flying pole, a work made in Mexico between 1660 and 1690. Ilona, we're going to be talking about a folding screen from 1690. Tell us about this work. Well, I'm very excited about this folding screen and I decided it would be a good jumping point to talk about many of the issues in the exhibition, not only because it's the first work that I was able to acquire for the museum in this area, but also because it represents a lot of the different things and the way I was trying to conceive of uh, forming this collection for the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. When I arrived here, there, there were practically no works of the Spanish colonial, Spanish American era. So we had to sort of find something that would make sense both uh, historically, but also for the city of Los Angeles and more broadly for the field. And folding screens are very interesting because when you see them, it immediately conjures up this idea of the East. So what is a folding screen doing within the context of 17th century Mexico? It's one of those really wonderful pieces that truly captures how global the world was beginning in the 16th century when all these voyages took place. Initially, as we all know, these voyages were largely driven by imperial desires to conquer lands and peoples, and um, European empires were set on uh, enriching themselves through the goods that they were finding in these uh, new regions. So In the 16th century, the Jesuits had a very strong presence in Japan. As, as we, we know, they, they were trying to proselytize Christianity. And uh, that's when the encounter with folding screens first took place. So the fascination with the folding screens took place within that context. And very soon after, this is, we're talking the 16th century, folding screens started being sent as gifts to important European members, including King Philip II from Spain and Pope Gregory XIII. As it often happens, taste trickles down from the top, and soon the, the nobility and the elite started um, getting really compelled by this very special objects, which initially were created uh, as the name of uh, folding screen or biombo means as windbreakers to protect spaces and enclose spaces from drafts, as well as creating privacy. So during this time, the shogun also sent diplomatic gifts to the Viceroy of Mexico, and this was around 1614. And soon after, more folding screens started entering New Spain at that time, mainly because of commerce with the East. As uh, we know, <laughs> Spain controlled all these commercial relationships with uh, Manila through the Manila trade, which started in 1565. And all the objects that were coming from the East were being centralized in Mexico, from which they were dispersed both back to Europe and to the rest of Spanish America. 
So through that commerce with Manila and the East came more folding screens. And soon after, artists in New Spain, who were extraordinarily consummate, started creating their own versions. Obviously, that sort of fusion of languages that you're talking about is very palpable in the sense that the painterly style appears extremely, you know, Spanish. It's, it seems to evoke the, the language that, that we're very familiar with in terms of European painting. Absolutely. That's what's so amazing about this type of object, because as an object, it conjures the East. Pictorially, it goes back to Western traditions, to European traditions. And in the case of the folding screen that we have at the L.A. County Museum of Art, which is really interesting and special, it actually depicts a subject that was completely locally entrenched. You have, in a way, the entire world condensed in this one object. One inevitably feels a certain level of conflict in viewing it, because I can see as an object it seems extremely precious. But of course, knowing of the the violences committed by colonial powers, I feel very conflicted looking at it. That's a really good question, and it's a good point, especially because of the moment that we are going through right now, which is a reassessment of our historical realities and the way we tell stories, right? Yeah. Uh, What I find really interesting, if you look at it slightly from a different angle, we can't uh, eschew the the incredible violence that took place through this process of conquest and colonization and the decimation of indigenous populations. But it's a reality, and it's a reality that we all have to contend with uh, in one way or another. So what, for me, is so meaningful about this type of objects, it's precisely that it allows you to tell those stories So it helps us keep uh, historical memory alive, and it helps us also question what those dynamics were and how to sort of address it in a way that is not entirely reactionary, but based on historical context, information, and deeper knowledge of what gave rise to these kind of objects which are astounding. And precisely what makes this feel so fascinating is that it allows us to engage with this very complex narrative of conquest, colonization, and the aftermath. And uh, what happens when all these societies by force mix and the culture that develops out of that interaction. Do we know anything about the individual or group of individuals who made this work? In the case of the folding screen, I've left it as unknown artist because, I mean, it's a very fine folding screen. And uh, we could spend more time trying to attribute it because there were really extraordinary painters in 17th century Mexico that were locally born. But I don't feel yet comfortable making an attribution, but it's one of the finest examples that we have. So we can circle around a group of artists, but I think it's more prudent to to exert caution when we, we make attributions sometimes. Can you say something about that sort of integration of local artists amid the colonial project, as it were? Because one of the interesting things is that wherever colonialism happened, they use the vital skills and the abundant skills of local people as part of that colonial project, don't they? Yes, I do, Ben, and I'm really glad that you bring that up because that's one of the main points that I'm trying to drive through the exhibition as well, that it's not that artists from Europe and uh, from other parts of the globe arrived in the new world and they imposed their own methods of work. We're also talking about a span of 300 years here. So what happened in the 16th century is very different than what happened in the 18th century and the late 18th century. The New World was uh, many countries in Latin America were on the brink of independence. So we can't also historically ourselves, we can't just create this historically unity across time and place. The, The region was very heterogeneous. There's many dynamics at play. There are many different types of people. So we we also should be cautious about trying to create one seamless narrative for this region and one seamless narrative about conquest and colonization. It's very complex and very rich. But it's true that when the Europeans arrived in the New World, they were capitalizing, too, on an incredible knowledge by indigenous artists, whereas it was producing objects of silver, for example, South America, and also in Spain, they were incredible silversmiths. So 
to be able to survive under this new regime as they had survived under different regimes in the own pre-colonial period, the artists were extraordinarily nimble and they adapted to their new circumstances, always with the aim of trying to stake out their own place within this budding new society. So that's really important to, to understand too. And I'm thinking here, for example, of a wonderful 16th century chalice that Lakma has, the very famous Hearst chalice, which combines rock crystal feathers, which was a pre-Hispanic tradition, and gold. So it's bringing all these different materials that were not only European, but were used in pre-colonial times. And artists are adapting their profound knowledge of fine skills that they had initially directed to, for example, the Mexica or the Aztec uh, rulers, they're now redirecting them to the new, quote unquote, lords of the land. And it's a way of keeping their own traditions vital, of showing that artists are fully able to understand their new realities and adapt to them covertly and overtly on occasions of maintaining their own traditions within the new societies. To what extent does the imagery depict reality? Because one of the things, again, about works made in the colonial era is that there are romanticist projects. There are projects that aim to sweeten the reality of what was going on in those societies. It's, again, this idea that not all the art is the same and not everything is meant to convey the same and not all the artist's projects or the commissioners is the same. So uh, we have to be careful with those kind of generalizations. And I, I think it's really important to keep that in mind. Let's talk about this folding screen as an mm. example, yeah. which depicts an Indian wedding. And the indigenous couple is portrayed to the right as they exit the church. And they're greeted by all this pre-colonial traditions or games, including a large flying pole, a man juggling a log with his feet, which was we know was pre-colonial too. And uh, what we refer to is uh, as a Moctezuma dance, where dancers were dressed to imitate the Mexica emperor. So these were all staples of festivals and different special occasions after the Spaniards arrived. So it's really interesting that Spanish people were mesmerized by some of the spectacles and while they were highly wary of the potential to awaken idolatry again, they still allowed many of these performances because they were quite dazzling. It's hard to tell how much they understood that they meant for local peoples. So it's that kind of tension that they are being portrayed in the arts and sometimes described in the chronicles as mostly from a sort of ethnographic, touristy point of view. But what this performance is and what these representations actually meant for the people who were creating them is a very different question. And we can't just talk about one or the other. There's, mm. there's both dynamics at play in many of these objects. And of course, there's both dynamics in terms of the architecture of the work as well, aren't there? Because on, on the left, we have homes, what look like the ordinary people's homes. And then on the right, you have a church. And of course, the church has a massive significance in the whole environment of Spanish America, right? Yes, absolutely. And I think the screen might be missing a couple of panels. So it would have been interesting to see what was depicted on either <laughs> side. Right. But if you look closely at the folding screen, the homes on the left, they have some kind of vegetation coming down from them, which we know was a typical element of public festivals in New Spain, and those were produced by indigenous populations. So there are all these really intricate details that you really have to go back to the sources and the chronicles to completely detangle them. There is a scene in the front where it's clear that the indigenous people are extracting the pulque, which was an intoxicating beverage from, out of this maguey, this large maguey or cactus. So that was probably hinting at the party that was going to ensue after the wedding ceremony. And uh, of course, the chronicles are filled with descriptions of how this intoxicating beverage caused all sorts of damages and riots and difficult, uh, uncontrollable situations in the colony. So this kind of work is, uh, I find them really mesmerizing because you have enough elements and you can 
to sort of make up a story. And you can almost imagine this type of folding screen or painting being presented in front of certain audiences and whomever's explaining it is kind of coming up with their, with their own story of events and perceptions of reality. And the farther away you are from colonial reality and colonial day-to-day -day or life in the Americas day-to-day -day life, the more the stories got concocted and invented and perceptions shifted. So these artworks are very powerful in creating, recreating, inventing stories. And it influenced people's mindsets about what was happening on the other side of the world. When communication was really slow to happen, we have no Instagram, we have no Facebook. And we, it's like letters took months and months to get from one side to the other if they arrived. So one can only imagine the power of the visual arts to spark people's imaginations. And lastly, do we have any knowledge of how this was used before it entered your museum and when it was privately owned? Was it used very much like a painting would be used or would it actually be a functional object in some way? This precise folding screen is really interesting. The provenance is really interesting. It comes from the royal Portuguese family it was in Brazil. And when it came to us, when it was offered to the LA County Museum of Art, it was framed. So the four panels were framed and we decided for this exhibition to restore it to its uh, originally intended format. Well, Elona, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Archive of the World, Art and Imagination in Spanish America, 1500 to 1800, is at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art from the 12th of June to the 30th of October. <music> And that's it for this episode. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Amy Dawson, Henrietta Bentel and David Clack. And David's also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Amy, Karen and Ilona. And thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.